no matter what your personality is, like your brain is malleable, your behavior is malleable. If you want to build like a, a new social life for yourself, like you have that potential to do so. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. Today's episode is on the science of social connection, how having strong, robust social connection actually makes us healthier. Listen on to learn more about how to build deeper relationships and live more fulfilling lives. Our guest today is David Robson. David Robson is an award-winning science writer and the author of The Intelligence Trap, The Expectation Effect, and The Laws of Connection, which just released this June. A graduate of Cambridge University, he previously worked as an editor at New Scientist. His writing has appeared in The Wall Street Journal, Guardian, The Atlantic, Men's Health, The Psychologist, The Washington Post, and many other publications. The Intelligence Trap has been translated into 15 languages. David lives in England. Hi, David. Welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? Yeah, I'm great. Thank you. Yeah, and thanks so much for having me. Yeah, thanks so much for being here. First, I want to ask you, what do you consider yourself an expert in? And tell us a little about your story getting here. So I think I'm an expert in um, human psychology, and in particular, um, looking at the way that our beliefs and expectations can shape our lives, um, especially our social relationships. Um, So I got here through a slightly convoluted route. Um, I studied mathematics at Cambridge University, uh, which gave me a great grounding, you know, understanding the scientific process, how to interpret statistics, you know, all of those things that are really necessary to be a science writer. And then I um, became a science writer at various publications in the UK. So um, New Scientist magazine, I was a feature editor there. Um, the BBC, where I was a senior journalist. And then I went freelance. Um, so I write for publications like The Atlantic, uh, The Wall Street Journal. And then I also started writing books about human psychology. So throughout this career, which has lasted now for 15 years, I've always focused on psychology and neuroscience and health. And they kind of really converge in my my books. Um, so my last one was called The Expectation Effect. And that looked specifically at how we create self-fulfilling prophecies that can influence our health and well-being. And then my latest is The Laws of Connection, which really examines the importance of social connection for our health. Uh, We know that it's one of the biggest predictors of good health and longevity, um, as important as diet or exercise. Um, And then it looks at the the kind of psychological biases, the uh, false beliefs and intuitions we can have that prevent us from building Uh, great relationships with the people around us. Um, And it feels like a very natural journey, actually, looking back at this. It's like all of my interests and skills, I feel like they've really converged on this career. Nice. Yeah, I thought your path was really interesting because going back to the beginning, like having a degree in mathematics doesn't seem like you'd become a writer, right? What was on your mind when you were in school? And then were you always a writer? So we have quite a specialized... um, kind of education system in the UK and that we become specialized very early on. And it was really tough for me to kind of choose to major in mathematics without any chance really of studying humanities or English and writing in particular during my degree. But it had always been a passion for me right from, you know, when I was um, at high school. Um, So really this career just allowed me to use that passion for writing and creativity to try to communicate complex, difficult ideas about um, how the brain works, how the body works, how we can use these findings to benefit ourselves. But yeah, how to communicate all of those things in the most accessible, entertaining, informative way possible. Yeah, no, I like that your path, it it really is like you're blending so many different facets into one, like, because people think writers are more creative, and yet you come from this, like, very, like, science mathematics background. So I, I think that's interesting. And then if you can explain to our listeners, like, what is science journalism, exactly? Like, what makes you different from, like, other writers or journalists? Yeah, so I mean, all of my writing is based on kind of really robust uh, research. So, um, you know, I read all of these um, scientific journals where scientists report their experiments and their results. And then I interpret those findings and try to find like a 
an innovative way of telling that story. So creating a narrative. So I'll draw um, specifically on the findings themselves. And, you know, I try to be really rigorous with my, like making sure it's 100% accurate and it includes all the nuances that you need to be true to the science. But I try to do that in a way that also incorporates the human element, you know, tells the story uh, perhaps of the scientists themselves or people who have been affected by this new science. Or I look to kind of history and literature, for examples, of, um, you know, illustrations of these concepts that I'm writing about. Um, so I try to be kind of multidisciplinary, looking at kind of philosophy and the kind of origin of the ideas that are then being investigated for science. Yeah. No, I love that you are the bridge between scientists and the, I guess, normal, regular people. You you kind of, tra you're the translator. Yeah, that's exactly how I see it. That's what I want to achieve. Yeah. Okay. I, I think that's so interesting. Okay. So tell us about what inspires you to choose a topic to write a book on. Like, is it because you read a lot of findings? Like, I guess, how do you weave together these books that you've created, starting from the intelligence gap? Yeah, it has to be something that personally really interests me. And often it's like a preoccupation that I've had from like, you know, when I was a kid or teenager. And then, you know, I'll just, as I go about my kind of daily kind of journalism and writing, like I often, you know, come across these papers that really appeal to those questions that I had, you know, like for my first book, like what is intelligence and what do our traditional measures of intelligence miss? For my latest book, it's all about kind of why is it so hard to have the kind of authentic relationships that we crave and what can we do about that? Um, so these are kind of questions that had been preoccupying me. And then, you know, I happen to come across work that kind of answers those questions. And that's like the spark of inspiration for me. Like when I come across a really new finding that I find like revolutionary, then I, I start thinking, oh, well, maybe like there's a, a larger body of literature there. So then typically I'll spend like months or even years of research kind of uh, digging really deep into that scientific literature, um, trying to work out, you know, what the story of that science is and um, particularly like how we could use that science to improve our lives. So it's answering those questions and then, you know, applying that to to make our lives kind of better, whether that's like making our decision making smarter or whether that's improving our relationships and finding new ways of, of finding connection. But yeah, it's kind of, there's a saying that I often hear scientists talk about, but I think it's very true for me as well, that um, research is me-search. Like I think it always has to come from something that I'm personally preoccupied about and then right. something that I can personally use myself and then once it, I've kind of proven it to myself, I want to share that with a bigger audience. Mm. And then what about the range of scientific research in your books? Are they more recent findings in research or are they like a wide range from like, you know, from the beginning of science to now? Yeah, I mean, I do. I love finding, you know, like even studies from like the 19th century, you know, those really peculiar experiments that you're often not allowed to perform anymore. So I do kind of touch on on those. But yeah, I really, I think science has changed a lot recently. Um, it's a lot more rigorous than it ever had been. Like there's a lot of emphasis now on finding robust um, discoveries that you can replicate again and again. So I do try to lean on the, the kind of most cutting edge research, really, because I think that's also the most reliable and the most meaningful. Yeah, definitely. And it's also important because I think people, especially with psychology, I think people only know so much and there's still so much to be explored. And we forget that there's always new research coming out. <laughs> and it's people like you, that, like we need you to explain this new research that's coming out so that we move forward. Yeah, that's exactly how I see it. And, you know, often like, um, I think we still have like a lot of um, misconceptions about the way the human brain works or, you know, about um, human psychology that the latest science is kind of correcting and, um, and you know, it's uh, full of so many new insights. Um, but that's what I want, want to really bring to people. All right, let's take a quick break. The show is sponsored by BetterHelp. When was the last time you learned something just for fun? 
When we were kids, we were constantly learning and exploring, but as adults, it's easy to lose that spark of curiosity. Whether it's learning a new language or starting a garden, keeping that joy of learning alive can be very fulfilling. Therapy with BetterHelp can reignite that sense of wonder and help you rediscover the passions you might have set aside. It's not just about overcoming challenges, it's about growing, exploring, and learning at any stage of life. I love being a student of life, and self discovery is a lifelong journey. I've enjoyed exploring. If you are looking to reconnect and discover more about yourself, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and perfectly suited to your schedule. And you can always switch therapists anytime at no additional charge. Rediscover your curiosity with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash TLL today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash TLL. Today, I want to talk about your newest book, The Laws of Connection. First of all, what fascinates you about this topic? Again, it's like um, personally, um, I was a really shy teenager in that I couldn't even kind of go into a store to kind of buy like a CD uh, without um, feeling like really nervous about those basic interactions. And I got over that, you know, from like basically when I started going to university, like I really got over my shyness to quite a, you know, quite an extent. And the same, you know, when I started my journalism degree, I was having to meet, um, like my journalism career, I was having to meet like a lot of new people. Um, you know, you when you interview someone, like even if it's about science, you have to have this kind of bond to get them to open up and to talk about, um, you know, what excites them about their research. So that kind of journey kind of, I'd always wondered, you know, like how did I make that transition? And then I just came across, like, about three or four years ago, I came across these new papers that just really told me, helped me to understand why I'd felt shy before and also how I'd overcome that shyness. And that was what I really wanted to share that with other people. Um, And my book, in the end, isn't just about kind of shyness. Like, I think what surprised me, actually, is that all of us, you know, no matter how shy or confident, introverted or extroverted we are, we're all carrying some uh, misconceptions, false beliefs, um, kind of wonky intuitions that can lead us to to kind of not not show our appreciation for others, and to you know they're just these psychological barriers that prevent us from having the most meaningful connections that we could with other people. That really appealed to me because I, I think there's something that everyone could learn from this research. Like there are so many of these barriers and so many different areas of our relationships, whether it's talking to a stranger for the first time to having a conversation with someone that you've known for 20 years, or whether it's like, um, you know, trying to get over a really big fight with your partner, or trying to support them through a terrible period in their life, uh, when they've undergone some kind of trauma. Um, there's just so much of this research is so relevant for all of these different areas. So, you know, I, that that inspired me because I thought, you know, I wanted to write a book that could be useful throughout our lives. It's not just like telling you like how to talk to strangers. It's telling us how to be better um, friends, colleagues, or family members. Amazing. Um, Why don't we first touch on why social connection is important for our physical health? And then I'd love to get into all those like psychological barriers that you mentioned. Again, this was another inspiration for the book because we've known for decades now that Uh, social connection is just so important for physical health. Um, You know, there are hundreds of studies all pointing in the same direction, and we can see it from other social animals as well. So it's really undeniable. And when you do these uh, meta-analyses, which are where you kind of combine the results of all of these different papers, you can really get an idea of, you know, you can quantify how important that is. And what you find is that all of these other lifestyle factors, like whether you smoke, how much alcohol you drink, whether you're overweight, um, how much exercise you do, um, whether you take medication for your blood pressure, you know, things that we are absolutely certain are fundamental for living a long and healthy life. Well, those factors are really important, but social connection is right up there with them. It's like one of the best predictors of who's going to um, who's going to survive and who's going to die within any particular year. Um, so it's so, so fundamental. And the, the big question then, like you said, is like, why would that be the case? It's kind of, it's quite amazing. But um, to understand why, I think we have to go back to evolutionary history. 
And you could see that as humans started living in bigger and bigger groups, um, social connection just started to be so fundamental to survival um, because we needed all those pooled resources and protection um, of our kind of peers from like the predators that might be uh, threatening us. And what this means is that when we feel um, isolation, we start developing a certain physical uh, response to that. Because once you were separated from the uh, group, you would be much more vulnerable to being attacked. And so we started to develop this physiological reaction that um, would help our wounds to heal and would prevent bacterial infections in those wounds. Um, and so those responses are things like um, increasing inflammation in the body and increasing the amount of blood clotting factor. Now, that is great. Like We evolved it because it's really useful if you are actually attacked. In the short term, it's going to save your life. But in the long term, those things are like really big risk factors right. for cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease, um, stroke, you know, all of the things that ultimately are going to kill us in our old age. So if you're feeling chronically lonely, like not just like for one day every so often, but if it's like day after day, year after year, you know, those risk factors eventually start to impact your long-term health and, and can ultimately kill you. Wow. This whole time I thought the loneliness was just mental, psychological, but you're saying it, there's a physiological response to, to, to being chronically lonely, the inflammation. Yeah, exactly. It's, you know, and that fits with like this very big kind of new understanding now of the, um, the nature of the mind-body connection and how, you know, mental health is so intimately connected with physical health. Amazing. Okay, so let's get into your favorite concepts. Like, let's talk about what you share in your book. What are like the biggest myths that you like to bust? I think my favorite one, and this was like the study that just like set it all off. It was so, it was so transformative for me. And it's a phenomenon called the liking gap. And essentially what the research shows is that you have, like when you meet someone for the first time, you often have like a really great conversation with that person. Like you just hit it off. They There's that instant rapport, that chemistry. You know, you you go away from that conversation feeling great and like you really, really like and admire and respect the other person. But you have these nagging doubts that maybe they were just being polite to you and actually they don't like you as much as you um, liked them. And the research just, I think we've all felt that, but the research shows that that is really common, this liking gap. And it can last a long time. So there were studies of people at um, university, like roommates living together. And even though they were seeing each other daily, um, they still felt the liking gap for about seven months after they'd first started like sharing a room, um, which is kind of amazing. So do you, you clarify, liking gap is when you like someone, but you're not sure if they like you back just as much? That's it. But the research shows that actually they do like you as much as you like them on average. <laughs> so both people like each other, but it's kind of like there's a doubt there. Right. You, un you totally underestimate how much you like them. Like basically, yeah, we're going through life not realizing how much we're loved because yeah, each person is feeling this. That's why it's so profound, I think, because... When you feel the liking gap, it kind of discourages you maybe from like exchanging numbers, suggesting that you meet up, up a second time in the workplace. Like it could be a colleague who you like really admire and want to collaborate with, but you, you're too shy to just because you feel they don't like you as much as you like them. You're kind of just too shy to, to reach out and say, like, could I help, help with this project or whatever? So. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's kind of true in all areas of our life. And I think it's one of the big reasons that we um, that we feel kind of lonely and that we crave more connection. It's just because we're missing all of these opportunities when there were people who really did like you as much as you like them, but we just, we didn't have faith in that. Yeah, and I think it's hard to gauge for some people. It all comes down to someone's level of confidence, right? Because it's naturally, if you're more shy or insecure, you might think, oh, this person might not like me as much. So how do you close this liking gap for the people that experience it? And I feel like this is so relatable and so common. Yeah, that's what I think it is. And so the research had looked at kind of, um, you know, does it correlate with levels of shyness? And it does. But actually, even people who are 
not especially shy, still feel it. So it's, I think it is almost like a universal experience. Like you say, it's like really important then that we overcome that. Kind of a firm believer that just kind of awareness of this can actually be really um, reassuring to us. Like I, I find that personally, that when I have those doubts, I just kind of remember the liking gap and I kind of recalibrate uh, my expectations a bit. I, it just makes me a bit braver to reach out. Um, like you still have to do so respectfully. Like not everyone is going to have the time or inclination to be like your best friend. But, right. you know, we can just try to reach out if we really, you know, we can be honest about our feelings. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be a declaration of love. It's just like <laughs> suggesting you get coffee. You know, it's not mm-hmm. a big deal, even if they do um, reject you. And the, the research just shows they're much less likely to reject you than you think. So, yeah, I think awareness is important and practice. I think that really uh, is kind of fundamental. But the research shows the more you talk to kind of strangers and um, practice your social skills, push yourself out of your comfort zone a little bit, the uh, easier it is to calibrate your expectations. So it kind of shrinks that um, that kind of liking gap in the anxiety you might feel. That makes sense. The more practice you get, the more you can gauge like how much people will respond. Because <laughs> if you're not good at connecting with people, that gap, you're saying the gap is bigger. Yeah, that's exactly it. And a lot of us don't, just don't get enough practice. Like, you know, we might kind of talk to strangers only when we really have to, like, you know, you're kind of networking um, for your job. But like, that might only be like once a month, you know, it's not necessarily enough for you to remember those interactions and how positive they were. So, you know, the research has shown if you just ask people to do, uh, to kind of strike up a conversation with a stranger, just like, you know, a few times a day for a period of like one week, even that period is long enough for them to start to feel much more optimistic about the the opportunity of connection. All right, let's take another quick break. Today's episode is brought to you by Lola V, the innovative hair care line founded by Jennifer Aniston. As we embrace autumn, it's the perfect time to upgrade your hair care with Lola V. I've been using Lola V products all year and my hair feels healthier and smoother. For those dealing with dry, itchy scalp, their new exfoliate and detox scalp shampoo is a dual action shampoo that combines a scalp scrub with a clarifying wash using activated charcoal, bamboo extract, and AHAs to remove buildup and balance your scalp. It also includes natural ingredients to soothe irritation and to promote thicker, fuller looking hair. Check out all Lola V products at their website at lolav.com. As our loyal listeners, you'll get an exclusive 15% off your entire order when you use the code LAVENDARE15 at checkout. That's 15% off your order at lolavie.com with promo code LAVENDARE15. Please note you can only use one promo code per order and discounts can't be combined. After you purchase, they'll ask you where you heard about them. Please support our show and tell them we sent you. Your hair will thank you. Okay, let's move on to other concepts. I have a whole list here. Like, what is the personality myth? Uh, This goes back to that idea that you might just think, like, I really want to kind of have, like, more friends or have better relationships with my colleagues or, you know, I'd, I'd like to improve my social life, but I just don't have the right personality to do that. It's kind of fixed. It's ingrained in, you know, in who I am and I can't change it. And the research just shows that's not true. So you can have these kind of interventions where you get um, people, you just encourage them to be more sociable um, over like a one or two week period. And it doesn't matter how introverted or extroverted someone was, everyone benefits and feels a lot better from having tried to connect and just like push themselves out of their comfort zone a little bit more. Similarly, you know, lots of people go around fe- feeling like their shyness is just something they can't overcome, that, like they just believe they, they don't have the social skills and they never will do. But um, when you change that mindset, when you get people to realize that actually that anxiety they're feeling isn't, you know, is, it's something that you can overcome with practice. Like just changing that belief helps them to cope better with those new social situations and actually makes it much easier for them to develop the social skills they want. Um, so the conclusion really is just, you know, no matter what your personality is, like your brain is malleable, your behavior is malleable. Um, if you want to build like a, a new social life for yourself, like you have that potential to do so. 
So in this study, how did they encourage these people to become more social? Is it just a matter of just try to be more social? Like what are, I guess, the ways? Because I'm sure people can relate. Oh, I feel a little shy, a little awkward. And like, yes, it may be possible to change, but how? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, that's a great point because actually... Um, I think, as we all know, just having a kind of vague intention um, often isn't enough. Like, you know, you need to, it needs to be concrete. Um, So, you know, there are lots of behaviors that we can do, but um, kind of the first step is just to have what we call implementation intentions. And that is a kind of um, concrete plan for something that you're going to change about your behavior. So it could just be that, say you're like a real, like, dog lover. And you could just be like, um, decide every time I see someone with a cute dog, I'm just going to approach them and like ask them a couple of questions about their dog. Uh, just be brave enough to kind of just strike up a conversation and see how it goes. Or, you know, like if you're a fashionista, you know, next time you see someone who's dressed in an amazing way, just tell them that you really admired their dress sense. Um, or, you know, you could be more altruistic, like, and decide every time you go to the supermarket, look for someone who's struggling to carry their shopping and just offer to take it to the car. So just really small steps, but that's what the research shows. Like finding concrete ways that you can do. Yeah, and because it's just, it kind of gives you fewer excuses, actually. If you've already told yourself, I'm going to do this in this particular situation, um, people are just much more likely to enact that. And, you know, once you start doing that, like if you do it kind of daily, um, that's when you see this really rapid change over the course of a week where suddenly, you know, all of your fears of the conversation being kind of super awkward and difficult, they just kind of evaporate because what you find is that, you know, those fears are so often unfounded and actually the conversation is really pleasant, people are warm, no one's, you know, it's very unusual for people to be hostile to you because most more often than not, they would actually prefer to have more social interactions in their lives as well. And so they're really grateful to you for giving the opportunity and for having taken that first step. Right, right. It's funny because everybody needs social interaction. And then I guess there's two types of people. Some people are open to it and then other people just, just want to be left alone. Don't talk to me because they're so introverted. So do you have any thoughts on that? So I think like we have to be really sensitive to like people's kind of the signs they're giving off. Like, I think if someone's, you know, reading, like really intently reading or listening, you know, they've got their headphones on, they're obviously like in their kind of own little world. Like, I don't think, you know, it's like advisable really to start talking to them necessarily. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to respect people's privacy. Um, But what the research shows in all of these studies is that, you know, we really expect people to respond badly when we try to strike up a conversation because we just think like assume that people do want their solitude but actually like having like a bad reaction is really unusual and the what the psychologists have done is they've they would kind of engineer these situations like on like commuter trains in Chicago where like the participants task was to kind of strike up a conversation with a stranger and then to give a a kind of questionnaire to that stranger and say like could you contact the researchers to say how you feel (laughs) <laughs> after this interaction. Uh-huh. Um, and what the research shows is that, you know, the strangers often feel better for mm. having had that interaction as well. Okay. So bad reactions, very rare. It kind of helps everyone. Like the person you're speaking to is probably more than likely going to be grateful for the conversation and you feel great for having the conversation too. Right, right. So I guess the lesson is don't assume that it'll go bad every time. Like it actually goes well more often than not. Yeah, exactly. That's the big kind of psychological barrier here. It's just that we are like pessimistic and we don't need to be. Like we could be much more optimistic. What other concepts are your absolute favorites to talk about from this book that you think everyone should know? There's something called the appreciation gap or the gratitude gap, which um, okay. is kind of similar to the liking gap. But I think it, it's something that we can all enact really easily. And it's another one of these ways that, you know, if you're feeling shy, like I think this is just such a good first step. Um, essentially, we, you know, a lot of us just think like really good things about the people around us all the time. Like we really admire and respect them and are grateful for kind of how kind they've been to us or, you know, 
how creative they are or, you know, all of these, how generous they are. But we just don't express those thoughts. Like, and we have these kind of negative assumptions again. We think that the other person's going to feel really awkward if we compliment them or they'll kind of consider that we're quite clumsy as we say the compliment. Like, we, we don't have the trust that we're kind of competent enough to say these kind of words like elegantly. Or we think they just kind of know they're great. Like, right. they don't. We assume they don't need us to say. And all of those assumptions are wrong. Like, actually, we just underestimate how much it would mean to someone to show more appreciation. So that's why it's a kind of gap, because we just don't recognize how much they uh, they want to hear these words from us. And all of the kind of fears that we have about kind of not being able to do it gracefully, um, you know, no one's judging us on that. They People are mostly just um, concerned about the warmth of the sentiment. They don't really care if you say it in a slightly kind of awkward or goofy way like and you know i'm sure sometimes that just makes it even more charming actually and you know like we you might think oh but won't it get a bit wearing for them if if we're like complimenting them kind of every day even but the research shows that actually no like people love every time you say compliment people love it even if you do it like every single day for a week people feel just as good at the end as they did at the beginning when you say that compliment so you know, this simple moral of that kind of story is that we just, we can afford to um, to show appreciation just so much more than we do. And it's a great way of just cementing this bond with other people. And a lack of appreciation, you know, it's so much a cause of like, um, you know, when friendships break down, when marriages break down in the workplace, it's the kind of one of the biggest reasons that people leave their jobs. It's one of the biggest causes of burnout. And it's so unnecessary. Um when, you know, often we're biting back our compliments and actually we should just be more open with them. Yeah, like there's so much more benefit to giving more compliments than there is like holding it back. You shouldn't hold your compliments back if you have something nice to say. Yeah, that's exactly it. And so um, it benefits the other person and it really benefits you too. And it can even, you know, we were talking about the health benefits of social connection. Well, actually, just this one social act can help to soothe your physiological stress response. Like you giving the compliment? Yeah, exactly. It soothes your response? Yeah, and the other person. So it's like a win-win for everyone. Um, There was this study that replicated kind of Shark Tank, you know, that TV program. And with pairs of participants, they just asked one of the participants to compliment and um, say a few words of gratitude to the other participant. And what they found was when they were giving the presentation and when they were coming up with the idea and giving the presentation, like both of the participants, the expressor and the receiver of that compliment, both of them like showed a more, a healthier, more optimum stress response. So they were kind of energized, but they were not going into that kind of panic, fight or flight kind of state. They were, they were just using their kind of nerves to their advantage. Wait, so how, how do they measure this? (laughs) Like, tell me more about the studies. It's relatively easy to measure people's um, stress response because you can just like um, measure things like people's blood pressure okay. and the uh, kind of heart rate, heart activity. And essentially, when people go into the fight or flight response, you see that the vessels at the kind of peripheries of the body are kind of constricting. And again, it's because you're expecting to be kind of injured by a predator or something. So you're like moving the blood kind of more centrally into your body so that you avoid blood loss at the um, kind of in your limbs. Oh, is that why people's hands get cold when they're nervous? Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. Mm, okay, I see. But if you have a more kind of optimum stress response, it's like your heart might be racing a little bit, but actually like all of those blood vessels are nicely dilated because it's more like you're kind of in a race. Um, and, you know, the blood is also like being pumped to your brain to kind of energize your thoughts and to kind of give you more energy. So yeah. stress in itself isn't, you know, necessarily a bad thing. It's just when you go kind of tip over into that fight or flight response, that it's kind of bad for your health. Oh, that's so interesting. Okay, so you're just saying all of this stuff, the social, like the complimenting, the like all of this is really related to our physical health. Yeah, exactly. It's just so fundamentally related. Um, you know, there are even studies just on like the common cold where people would like go into a laboratory and be deliberately infected with the virus. Um, and you could predict who was going to develop the infection just from 
like measures of like how much social support they felt wow. in their life. Yeah, like how well connected they were. Yeah, like their immune system is a little stronger if they have social connection. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's kind of stronger specifically for like to get into the kind of nitty gritty. It's stronger um, to fight against viruses because mm. if you were living in a big group, infection of like respiratory disease is much more likely. So yeah, that's why it's kind of primed to fight kind of all of those infections. Yeah. Oh, I see. A lot of this stuff to me, it it feels like I know it to be true, but I think it's nice hearing the science back it up that people have been doing these studies. Like, were there any findings that surprised you that kind of went against what you thought? I guess like a a lot of them went against what I thought because it was like, like even something like the liking gap or the gratitude gap. I guess because I I probably carried those false intuitions that like, I'd always had that, you know, anxiety, like, is it okay to compliment or to compliment people a lot? Or is it something that we should like hold back because we don't want to seem to gushing? So I guess a lot of this research is kind of, yeah, it's kind of calibrating that and just giving you the kind of, it's empowering you to feel like, no, it's okay. I, I'm going to do what I think is right. And, you know, I'm going to be braver. Um, but yeah. yeah, there were some things that like did really surprise me. Um, so one concerns honesty. And like, obviously, I know like to be a moral person, you have to be honest. You shouldn't be like betraying people. You know, like that is that is obvious. But I guess I'd assumed that like little white lies, like massaging the truth, you know, maybe avoiding giving negative feedback unless it's like absolutely necessary. I'd kind of thought those things were important for maintaining social connection. Yeah. Yeah, that is a complex area. But the research is pretty. Yeah, what is the finding? There was this study that just said to like, kind of split the participants into different groups. Some were told to just focus on being as honest as they could be, like to never lie within a a kind of three-day period. The others were told to be either to go about their daily business as normal or to be as kind as they could be. Um, so just try to do what you can to like make people feel good and to, to serve them as well as you can. I had totally expected that the kind of kind group would come off best, that they would feel the greatest social connection, that they would feel the best about themselves. I kind of thought the honest group would end up having really difficult interactions that would, you know, would ba- it would backfire quite badly. But mm-hmm. that wasn't what the researchers found at all. That actually... Um, whether you were being honest or whether you were being kind, like both of those led to better social interactions than just carrying on as people would have done normally. Um, And that actually those in the honest group, uh, what really stood out was that they really appreciated how meaningful the interactions became. Like even when the interactions were quite difficult, they still felt like it was better to have been honest than to have kind of told those white lies like they would have normally done. Yeah. And there's just so much research then that backs that up that shows that, you know, in the workplace, wherever, like just giving honest negative feedback, we assume people are going to resent us for that, that they're not going to want to hear it. Um, But people just really appreciate your bravery for telling the truth. It's not an excuse to just like be like brutally rude. I, I really strongly believe that you can be honest and tactful at the same right. time and you can say and the nicest, you know, you can still try to be constructive. You can offer to help if you think like it is going to have like damage someone's confidence. You can try to uh, emphasize all of the kind of, you know, ways they can learn from this and improve. Um, I think that's all really important, but that can only happen if you do act honestly. Um, mm-hmm. And that's just not possible if you just kind of cover it up and tell that white lie. I like that this is a scientific research that has found this because it is something that I think some people are raised to think, oh, it's good to like tell white lies and it, it's not hurtful. But I think being honest takes so much courage. But when when you're honest, even if you're saying something negative, it opens, it, it's like you're being vulnerable. And then once you open up your vulnerability, it allows other people to open up, right? And then that builds like a more honest, true connection. Yeah, that's exactly it. And actually, I'm so glad you mentioned vulnerability because there's a related um, phenomenon called the beautiful mess effect. And this is just that we, you know, like we assume that if we reveal the things that make us feel weak or vulnerable, that we're going to be judged 
badly for that, that people are going to kind of feel alienated by it. So, you know, like if you really screwed up with your work and, you know, it's like if you've made a bad error that you're kind of ashamed of, um, you know, you like you just hate telling people about that. But actually, people see a lot of courage in owning up to that. And like, that's the prevailing like emotion that people are experiencing is admiration for your courage and honesty. Like we just value honesty so much in relationships that, um, and we just underestimate that. Like there was another study looking at kind of people's attitudes to dating. And they found that say like, if someone had acted like really horrifically in the past, like um, that knowingly like slept with people when they had an STD, um, admitting to that fact was still favorable to like refusing to answer the question like because oh, yeah. that yeah. just seemed so much more dishonest e- even if though you don't actually know the truth behind that but just you know it could be that so- even if you're like totally clean but you're for some reason refusing to tell the truth it's just the assumption that there's something that you're hiding that there's some kind of dishonesty there is like just considered yeah like it's um a real turn off for for anyone who wants to build any kind of social relationship with you. Mm-hmm. So you're saying it's it's better to be honest rather than, you know how some people think it's good to be mysterious and not let people know too much about right. themselves. So so this is saying, no, show, show everything, the ugly parts. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly that. And, you know, we have so many kind of tricks that we can try to play to avoid lying, but to avoid telling the truth. So, right. you know, like if someone asks you a question, you can try to deflect the question or you can you can kind of say something that is true, but isn't answering the question, you know, all of these things. But people are very sensitive to that. They kind of know what you're doing and they judge you badly for it. Whereas, like you said, if you just say the truth, even if it's not especially favorable or flattering, that is still ultimately um, better for the relationship in the long run. Okay, I think you also have some a concept where you you say it's a simple technique to resolve arguments. <laughs> Can you tell us about that? You know, I think we all know, <laughs> like a lot of us just are not good at um, in the middle of a fight with someone. We're not good at seeing the big picture, at kind of uh, considering the other person's point of view. Like we each party gets very defensive, and often we focus on like these tiny details. It's like we have this kind of microscopic attention that makes even like the smallest kind of things, like the you know, particular words someone said, we start to kind of blow up and, and, you know, think that is like the most important thing in the world. Um, And that's why we struggle to apologize, struggle to find resolution. What this strategy called psychological distancing does is it just like, it's like allowing you to take that step back. It's almost like, you know, like how you might feel like days, weeks or months after the event when you're like, I don't know why, you know, you just can't understand anymore why an argument happened. Um, just trying to get you to that kind of more philosophical point. Um, and it's very easy to, to achieve actually. So, I mean, put simply, like, um, you just try to imagine yourself in a different perspective. So you could imagine being just an objective observer, looking at the scene, like when you're having this argument, you could imagine kind of, putting yourself in the future, like in a year's time or 10 years time, and kind of just, you know, what will you just try to think, like, what will my opinions be in, you know, 2025 or 2034? Just kind of go through that process, like a bit of like imaginative kind of role playing. And it really works. Like there was this study that took married couples, people who are just, you know, newlyweds, um, who start arguing quite quickly, certainly. Um, and like for the first year, the researchers didn't do anything. They just tracked their relationship satisfaction. And there was this kind of steady decrease. It's, it's quite sad, but that is what happens often is people's satisfaction slowly goes down. And then kind of midway through, they taught people psychological distancing. And then they tracked their happiness for the rest, uh, for the next year. And what they found was that it just stopped that negative trajectory. That technique just helped them to kind of get over these arguments so much more easily that they maintained good relationship satisfaction. Um, People who weren't taught the technique just continued kind of along that kind of downward spiral. 
Wow, that's so interesting. So you're saying this distance, you're supposed to do this when you're in the argument, like take a moment and imagine yourself a year from now or some something like that. Like, is it, do you do it when you're in the argument or is, is it a reflection afterward? Right. I mean, I think ideally you could try to do it really quickly during the argument. You're right. But I also think a lot of arguments, are, you know, the problem is not necessarily that you said cross, uh, cross words in the moment, but it's like that sometimes it can linger for like hours or days or, you know, like that's when the resentment I think really starts to build actually is, you know, when it goes on for too long and when the bad feeling just kind of festers. So actually I think, you know, chances are you might not be able to do it in the middle of the argument because you're still feeling a bit too kind of angry or hurt. But, you know, if you kind of go for a walk around the block or, you know, you just like take a bit of time for reflection like straight afterwards, I think that's when it's ideal really so that you can go back to the other person just with a more constructive mindset, recognizing what your faults might have been. You're better able to articulate kind of what had hurt you as well. Yeah, It just helps you to to navigate your way through that. It's not just about you kind of apologizing instantly because often sometimes we are, have legitimate reasons to be annoyed, but it does allow us to focus on the things that really matter and separate them from the things that didn't matter and to express things in the, the most constructive way possible. Right. And this is something that both parties need to be able to do, right? To be able to take themselves like far away from that moment. Yeah. Again, I think ideally both partners would do it. I mean, I think there would be benefits if just one partner did it. But yeah, I think like in a couple, um, you'd want want both partners to do it really. But I think it's equally right. relevant for like friendships at work. You know, if you're struggling with your boss, like I still think like just you personally doing the um, psychological distancing will at least make sure that you're not being kind of dragged into this negative spiral so that at least you can try to be more constructive. Definitely. Okay. So next I'm curious, what's your take on social media? Like, is it helping us or hurting us? And how do we build real connections in this digital age? A lot has been kind of written and said about social media's kind of negative impact on mental health. And I think, you know, there's good reason to think it can be a problem. Um, But I think what psychology is moving towards now is recognizing it's kind of on, it varies like by individual and even within an individual's life. So I think there could be times when we're using social media and it's like totally healthy and actually is, you know, helping us to kind of achieve our goals and to to kind of get the connection we desire. And other times maybe we're engaging in less healthy behaviors. And I would separate those behaviors into kind of two broad categories. Social comparison, when you're using social media to kind of either to try to kind of paint this perfect view of your own life or, and also when you're kind of feeling envious and jealous and comparing yourself to other people's lives. Um, I don't think there's much debate amongst psychologists that this is bad for our mental health. Like social Mm -hmm. comparison is always pretty dispiriting because no matter how successful you are, it's like a never ending battle because you're always going to find someone else who's achieving more you know, seems happier, seems healthier, whatever. So it's, it's, you know, it's a battle you can't win. And just to try to, when you catch yourself doing that, to just try to disengage, I think that's a really good thing to do. And even, you know, when we're portraying our own, own lives and, you know, I think a lot of us sometimes are feeling a lot of pain inside, you know, for like stuff that's going on privately. And we might think it will make us feel better to put this kind of polished veneer on social media. But actually, I think all that does is actually make us feel more isolated because Mm -hmm. it just emphasizes the fact that other people don't understand kind of what we're going through. And a bit, you know, when we spoke about the beautiful mess effect, like by not showing the kind of messy part of our life, and we're not allowing other people to kind of share their vulnerabilities in turn and actually recognizing that we're all going through you know, we're all suffering often in some way, like that shared humanity can be a great source of of connection and comfort to us to recognize that it can be a source of compassion. And if we're using social media in these ways, we're not really allowing that to develop. Um, Mm -hmm. So that's the bad behavior. (laughs) The healthier way, I think, is to recognize that actually social media, modern technology has given us all of these tools that mean that we can reach out to people and for meaningful connections um, in ways that we just never would have been able to before. You know, like if you 
you can live in a totally different part of the world to someone and yet you can be in regular contact with them now. Like one of my best friends I just happened to meet when I was doing like kind of filming a short documentary in Sardinia, like she was on the team and like we just instantly hit it up. And like, because we have like, you know, social media like Instagram, we have WhatsApp, all of the, we can interact like daily or weekly um, in a way that wouldn't have been possible before. And so I think recognizing that fact and just making sure that we're using new technology in that way, I think that's that's healthy and it can really enhance our lives. Yeah, I love that. That's a very balanced answer is like there, it, it really is just a tool. You can use it in a healthy way if you're aware of like what's positive and then you can just avoid the negative ways to use it. But I think it all comes down to awareness. Like it's not good to compare yourself. It's not good to put up a front, like the filter that you mentioned. And it's like, I think more and more I've seen the trend of, in social media is like, we're moving away from that like perfect image and more more people are becoming more vulnerable. Yeah, I totally agree. I think it is just like using it mindfully in the way that you said. I think that can be so powerful. Okay, David, I'm curious, how has your personal life evolved since you started writing about this topic? Like, have you implemented these changes? And I guess, I don't know, I'm, I'm just curious. I have like implemented that. Like, um, that's one of my kind of rules for writing, actually, is that... Um, I don't want to share like a piece of advice if I don't have enough faith in it to try it for myself. So like all of these things like being more honest, being more vulnerable, complimenting more, or just showing appreciation more, talking to strangers more, you know, you name it, I've kind of done it. And yeah. I have found it incredibly rewarding. Um, you know, I I did used to feel um like I had depression and I, that would often be accompanied by like these kind of feelings of um, loneliness, you know, it's that kind of moment in the middle of the night when you wake up kind of with that existential isolation and just thinking like no one understands me. You know, I think everyone kind of experiences that at some point in their life. But I do think this has really helped me to kind of overcome those moments. Like I just feel um, much braver in social situations, especially with work. Um, I feel much better able to kind of navigate my relationships with my friends and my family. Um, you know, I feel closer to a lot more people. Um, so yeah, it has transformed my life. And I guess that's why I'm quite kind of evangelical about this research and why I want to share it with so many people. Yeah. What are the concepts or habits that have stuck with you most? Like, what do you find yourself doing more now that you didn't do before diving into this? I think being more honest about vulnerability so recognizing that beautiful mess effect but also there is a converse uh, there's like a, a different side to that which is called confelicity and basically uh, so confelicity is the kind of joy of sharing happiness and what the research showed and again this really surprised me was that um we often hide our successes because we're worried about seeming like we're bragging evoking yeah. MV, getting people, you know, like, so we hide our successes. And actually that is as bad as hiding our vulnerabilities. Mm, um, like okay. People feel pretty insulted, actually. If you, like, imagine your best friend or, like, you know, a sibling um, who, imagine how, like, you would feel if you found out they had something great in their life and they just hadn't told you. It feels like they don't trust you, mm -hmm. that they're kind of managing your emotions because maybe they think you're going to, like, act up and be like a, a spoiled brat like we and we we often when we're hiding our success we just don't even consider how the other person's going to perceive that when they actually find out like about our achievements or the things that are making us happy so rather than evoking like envy like what the research shows is that just being honest about the things that are making us happy often evokes confelicity in the other person too and that is really important to share so we just shouldn't be shy about talking about the things that are giving us joy. And so that's something that I've really taken on board too. It's like I'm happier now to share both the things that are making me anxious or, you know, that I'm kind of have felt shame for. But I'm also happier to talk about the things that are giving me real pleasure in my life. And that has just, you know, it really has. I added so much more color to my relationships, I guess. It's just, I really feel the connection from doing that. Yeah, it's beautiful. I guess the main message I'm hearing is that 
once you remove these filters that we put on ourselves because of whatever fear of judgment, fear, I don't know what kind of fear we have, but once we remove that filter and just express how, who we are, how we honestly feel or what we're honestly going through, it usually like results in a positive effect, like showing the happy sides and the the vulnerable negative sides. It's, it's showing, it, it just seems like we're sh- just showing more is the answer. <laughs> Sharing more, showing more. Yeah, that's exactly how I think it is. It's, it's exactly like you said, like we have filters, with, we have this fear of judgment that leads us to filter everything and actually just removing that and letting people see like, you know, the whole of you rather than like this tiny little part of you. Right. You know, that creates connection. That is what is, it's just so fundamental for connection. And I think we often, we don't recognize that fact. Okay, David, if we, if you could share like an actionable tip for listeners to implement today, what would that be? So I think this goes back to kind of technology maybe and how we can use it to our advantage. So I think we all have people in our lives who like we really love but we don't see them nearly as often as we should do. And we have maybe neglected them a bit by like not, you know, not messaging them. Like we might be waiting for the perfect moment to message them to say, we're still thinking of them, but it just never comes. So we, those, you know, that bond starts to feel like it's weakening. And the research shows actually that like, um, it's like never a bad time to reach out to those people. And we don't need to like wait for that perfect moment and we don't need to worry that they will have moved on with their lives because you know again the chances are like the 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 odds are stacked in your favor like that person is more likely than not to just be thinking about you and missing you too and actually just reaching out to them and letting them know that like everyone feels happier you re-establish your connection and you know nothing that we fear actually comes to pass like so that would be that's another thing that I practice myself and that's what I think you could do like immediately after you stop listening is just to kind of contact that person and just let them know that you're thinking of them, that you care about them, that you love them. Oh, that's a really great tip. Cause I think yeah, even when you say that, I like have a couple people on my mind, like people you've been meaning to contact, but have just been waiting for the right moment, but there is no perfect moment. <laughs> Maybe no, yeah. just practice when you think of someone, let them know, like simple as that. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's another one of those implementation intentions. And I just think it's very liberating. And yeah, it can, you know, only add joy to your life. I love that. Amazing. Okay, so David, where can we find you online? So I'm on um, Instagram, just kind of starting out, like building up a following um, David A. Robson. I'm on Twitter, D underscore A underscore Robson. Uh, my website with like more details of my books and my journalism. Um, that's uh, davidrobson.me. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing everything about your new book today. I'll leave all the links in the description or in the show notes for everyone to check out more of David's work and his new book. Thank you so much. This was really empowering and encouraging to just go out and just connect more. Like there's, there's nothing to be afraid of. <laughs> Yeah, uh, thank you so much for the brilliant questions and I've loved hearing your insights. 